Well, I'm still very incredulous and bemused about being enshrined in this ultimate shrine of tennis, the International Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum. But somebody said to me as I came in, how nice to be in a museum before you're stuffed. <laughs> so I'm enjoying this moment. Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. We are here with a special presentation, a deep dive into the life and times of one Ted Tinling. Cuthbert Collingwood Tinling, a special for Pride Month uh, in the short interim between clay and grass. It just feels so fitting to slip this in there because so much of Ted's life and 20th century tennis was centered around Wimbledon. How come when we didn't do a Pride special on Bill Tilden? Well, he <laughs> was included in our first Pride special. That was in 2019. Check it out. Bill Tilden is a very complicated and a problematic figure. Mm -hmm. But no doubt was one of the great sports superstars of the first half of the 20th century. Who when is largely overlooked because of what happened in his life. When you say complicated, do you mean pedophilic? Well, that's the thing. Whenever we're doing an episode like this, one of the questions that we have to answer to ourselves and in a satisfactory way to justify doing an episode is why. Why do an episode on Ted Tinling? Is there enough there to warrant an entire episode? And it became abundantly clear very early on that... There would be no shortage of information on Ted Tinling to present in an episode like this, simply because you could make the argument that no single person in the history of all tennis saw more across more eras or had his or her hands in as many facets of tennis as did Ted Tinling. Right. Ted is primarily known as a fashion designer as the designer of most of these outfits you saw on the Virginia Slim circuit in the 1970s. But he was also a historian, a writer. He was a professional tennis player for a time, a master of ceremonies, a chair umpire, a player liaison, a publicist, a, quote, call boy at Wimbledon. And finally, we get to a designer, a couturier, which was his real calling. Frank DeFord, writing about Ted Tinling, kind of goes through all the different hats that Ted wore, all the specific important moments in tennis history that he was there for. Not just tangentially or knew somebody who was there. It becomes kind of ludicrous, really. <laughs> he was at the famous tennis match between Don Budge and Gottfried von Kram. He umpired the first match ever played at Roland Garros in Paris. He was on the ship when Japanese player Hirosato, who was at the time despondent over leaving his fiancée to play a Davis Cup tie in Europe, he was on that ship when Hirosato committed suicide by throwing himself overboard. He was a player liaison at Wimbledon for 20 plus years before he got the sack in 1949. Frank DeFord writes that he was there at the scene when Billie Jean King beat Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sexes. But more than that, he was intricately involved in the designing of the dress that Billie Jean wore for that match. And you spoke about his role in the early days of the WTA tour, the Virginia Sims tour at that time, and how he was tasked with designing dresses for pretty much all the women. Mm -hmm. And with all that said, that doesn't even include where he got his start in tennis. A 13-year-old boy, by happenstance, being called upon to umpire for Suzanne Longlin. So you can see that Ted Tinling's life was ripe for discussion. This could have been a series of episodes. And our goal is kind of to highlight some of the themes we found in the reading and, and pull out some key events 
in Tinling's life and events that kind of changed the course of tennis history. Ted was openly gay, but it's very, very difficult, nay, impossible, to find contemporary accounts of Ted's personal life. Whenever I've seen him referred to as, quote, openly gay, it's always after his death. He doesn't write about his personal life in any of the books that he published himself. Now, this is not surprising, considering, you know, Ted was born in 1910. He lived through a lot of different eras in different countries. He served in the military. Tennis was not particularly warm to gay male athletes at the time. And, well, you could argue that it's still not. But there's so much left in the dark about Ted's personal life that it it was just fascinating to read his words about other people. Because so much of Ted's books were about the people he encountered. He was really one of the most important storytellers of tennis. And if you've listened to this podcast before, you know that I'm really, really drawn to the people who can tell us about our sports history, like Billie Jean King. So instead you have people writing about Ted Tinling and talking about him with euphemisms. Bud Collins used one that stuck when he called him, quote, the leaning tower of pizzazz. Other words used to describe him, he was a dandy. You know, all these these words that tiptoe around an, an essential element of who he was that was never really talked about publicly, but everybody knew. Right. He was also called gargantuan, bald, and boldly opinionated. He had a big personality. He could be incredibly warm and complimentary, and reportedly he could also cut down and devastate the biggest egos out there. He wore a one-carat diamond earring in his left ear. You can imagine this was not common in the 60s and 70s, especially as he was an old man at the time. He wore gold chains, these wide, colorful ties... And so his personal style itself pushed boundaries. And this is not even getting into the uh, the waves he made very purposefully at Wimbledon. He was the youngest child of a, quote, middle-class family in Eastbourne, south coast of England. And in this sense, middle-class meaning the working wealthy in Britain. He had a household staff. Reading that, I laughed a bit because he was kind of describing himself as coming from somewhat modest means and then proceeded to list all the people who worked in his house <laughs> growing up? Yes. Uh, in in England, middle class does mean something quite different than it means in the United States. Here we're talking about people who work, but who are extremely comfortable. You might be wondering, how does a boy from Eastbourne end up in the south of France on the French Riviera in a position to become besties with Suzanne Longlin. Since he was a child, Ted suffered from asthma. And during the winter months, starting in October, he spent most of his time in bed. And he tells that he learned to sew as a child while he was sitting in bed and had nothing to do. His father was a chartered accountant. His parents were, you know, very Victorian, middle-class people. His mother was drawn to progressive sort of cults and different schools of thoughts so they're very different but this is a very patrician household and so because of his health the tinlings relocate to switzerland first and then to the south of france where they find just uh, an absolute boom of of this leisure class living this jazz age lifestyle i'd always heard about this era in tennis but i didn't really know the nitty-gritty of how it came to be why was the French Riviera such, uh, as you said, a hotbed for tennis in the 1920s? So explain to us how that came to be, because I think that's one of the important historical lessons that we can glean (laughs) from this episode. Yeah. First of all, at the time, tennis was seen as a very English game. It, of course, was played in France. There were major tournaments held in France on clay and on hard court. It was played in the U.S.? Right. But in the south of France, this was seen as a a very English indoor pastime. Now, let's rewind to the mid to late 19th century. Queen Victoria is basically the first monarch of Europe to go to the Riviera and stay there, to build a villa. 
And of course, Victoria and all her many, many cousins across the continent, she inspired other royals and other aristocrats to come to Provence, which is the region in the southeast of France, set up these villas. Gambling was legalized in the mid-1800s, so this brings a ton of wealth. And basically people with money and time to just spend time doing nothing. Monaco also became a center of commercial gambling in the 19th century. And so that also attracted a lot of wealthy visitors. And with the casinos being kind of a cultural center of social life at that time, and the prevalence of so many British people, these casinos started to build tennis courts at those casinos. So it really became kind of a destination for the British. Right. And of course, you know some of these tennis courts. There's the Monte Carlo site in Monaco. We're talking about cities like Nice, Cannes, Menton, just absolutely gorgeous places. The, you know, the artists Van Gogh and Cezanne were depicting the beauty of Provence at this time. And it uh, sort of obtained this mythical quality. Today, Paris is the center of tennis in France. It's where Roland Garros is. It's where the French Open is. But at that time, tennis had not made its way to Paris, really. The south of France was squarely the hotbed for tennis in France. Right. And the, the Paris government, in particular, didn't really support tennis in a material way until the Four Musketeers in the mid-20s. And, you know, they won Davis Cup in 1927 and changed French tennis forever. But for the time being, this... 1910s and 1920s boomtown is is very English in character. However, they have a homegrown superstar named Suzanne Longlin. You do a lot of reading about Suzanne, and there's a lot of talk about Papa, her father, who's often referred to as Papa, him not wanting her to travel to meet other stars of the era, to play them outside of France that she spent the majority of her career playing in France. And when you do this reading, you understand why. It's a, At that time, there was no air travel. It was a big hullabaloo to get across the ocean. <laughs> you know, it required a lot of planning, a lot of travel. And so when you are this homegrown star and you are the greatest, why put yourself through all that to prove it to other people? Right. And a lot of it was just a strange and troubling relationship between her and her father this codependent relationship they needed each other but Suzanne had basically all the makings of a classic tragic diva and she was the superstar of tennis in the first few decades of the 20th century nobody came close somebody who also had a big part to play in the crossover between tennis and fashion Mm -hmm. and here comes Ted Tinling a 13-year-old boy who happens to be gifted a membership to the Nice Tennis Club where Suzanne plays. And lo and behold, right before one of her matches, they are without an umpire, and the story is told that her team, chief of which was Papa, scans the crowd and sees a very eager young boy and asks him, are you able to do this? <laughs> and he says, yeah. Can you, this sounds like fiction, but it it did actually happen. Like a random teenager was selected to umpire this superstars match. And it was like a strange time in tennis, right? Because she wasn't professional. She technically wasn't supposed to be earning any money, but she played every single day between uh, the cocktail hour, which was early, and tea. And so in the Riviera, a lot of French people were taking up these English traditions So they were doing tea in the afternoon. Suzanne was part of their daily entertainment. Now, after Ted was asked to officiate this match, he said that Suzanne, who was known to be quite imperious, was very friendly, that her father suggested that Ted continue to umpire all of her matches going forward. And for two years, for 104 matches, he was the chair umpire for Suzanne Longlin. By the time Ted encountered Suzanne in 1924, she was in the middle of a 179-match win streak. She had just completed a string of five straight Wimbledon singles titles. And I just want to talk for a second about her first trip to Wimbledon in 1919. 
She was the dominant player in 1915, World War I completely stopped tennis and, of course, her momentum. But she arrives in Wimbledon having never played on grass courts in her life and absolutely shocks the, the establishment in London because of what she's wearing. She's wearing a calf-length dress without a petticoat, without a corset, that shows off her silhouette. This was unheard of at the time. This is a hundred-year history, minimum, of white people at Wimbledon being shocked by women and how they look and how they dress. <laughs> I, in doing this reading, I just could not stop coming back to how... Are we at that different of a place? Honestly. Well, right. Like, are you not tired of being shocked all the time? <laughs> it's a clear pattern. It happens a lot. So, in 1919... Women didn't show their ankles. They didn't show their arms. The women's locker room would be full of bone corsets stained in blood because they were so constricting and so painful that they actually drew blood from the competitors. As a kid, Ted grew up around Suzanne, someone who saw her tennis clothes as fashion, as theater. She's famous for the way she moved, the way her clothes draped across her body, and the practicality. The fact that she needed freedom of movement, that she wore this very fashionable bandeau, the scarf around her hair to keep her hair in place. And so you have this marriage of show business and function. Suzanne goes professional after those two years with Ted as the chair umpire. And what what does he do with his life at that point? He's still only 15. He has his whole life ahead of him. Suzanne goes pro in 26. In 1927, Tinling is asked to umpire at the French Open, which at the time is still in St. Cloud, a suburb of Paris. Then he was asked to work at Wimbledon a few weeks later, starting at Wimbledon on the day before his 17th birthday. He joins the Wimbledon Championship temporary staff. And then the following year, he was appointed to this role that he held for two decades, which was kind of a player relations role and an escort. He was in charge of notifying players when they were to come on court and bringing them to court. Because in those days, it was actually easy to miss your call time. All this while, he was still based in France. But by 1931, the French government stopped issuing working visas to foreigners. And so Ted had to return to London. He starts in South Kensington as, quote, London's youngest couturier. And after a year doing that, he sets up his first business in Mayfair with a staff of five people. So doing the math here, he is 20, 21 years old. He's lived a life that most people can already only dream of. <laughs> and here he is about to embark on the start of his professional career in earnest. Right. Now, you know, he was not an aristocrat, but he grew up alongside famous people incredibly well-connected people, even royalty living in the south of France. So he had an in, right? He Which is to say there was a great deal of privilege. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, he sets up in Mayfair, this Tony London neighborhood that abuts Buckingham Palace. And he becomes a very successful young designer in London. And at the start, he's mostly doing wedding dresses. And he's catering to socialites and the extremely wealthy who know to come to him because of his connections. In his second show, none other than Suzanne Longlen walked in that show. <laughs> right. As After she uh, retired from her pro career, she became a friend. She became a lot more relaxed. And, you know, she and Ted were more like peers at that point. Pre-war... Ted has developed a great reputation in London as a couturier. He even designed a dress for Suzanne's comeback tour in 1937. And guess what's right around the corner, right? So as the Tinlings leave the south of France, the world enters a Great Depression. It's really the end of the Jazz Age. It's an end of this idyllic phase in the south of France. And it was also the dawn of a world war. And during this war, Ted serves in the army. He does so for seven years, and it's only revealed after his death as if we needed more ludicrous things to believe about Ted Tinling. <laughs> we learn after his death that he was a British spy in World <laughs> War II. Right. And like another famous designer, Coco Chanel, 
but he was a spy for the right side. Mm. Also, if you recall from one of our previous episodes, he is not the only wartime spy in tennis. Remind me. Allegedly, Ellis Marble was a spy as well. Yes, and even, I mean, Helen Wills Moody was an officer in the Navy during World War II. So this seven years that Ted was in the Army is sort of a black hole as far as his history. We know very little about it. There's very little written about it. It's almost like his life is upended with the Blitz in 1939, is forced to close his shop amid blackouts. And we don't really hear a peep until after the war. When he emerges from the Army... He finds it difficult to get back into designing as he knew it before the war, mainly because of a shortage of materials. He couldn't design the way he wanted to like he did before, simply because of rationing, not having what he needed at his disposal. So at this point, he decides to pivot into finally becoming a tennis couturier. He's written that before the mid to late 1940s, there wasn't really much tennis fashion to speak of. It was women wearing fairly plain utilitarian outfits. Some women wear shorts, like Helen Jacobs, and the men would wear t-shirts. They would wear navy surplus clothes, (laughs) cricket sweaters, of course. Ted Tinling, you know, added some flair with those grizzly bear sweaters that he wore, but there wasn't really tennis fashion per se. This is where he starts to rock the boat in England, specifically at Wimbledon, with his designs. In 1947, he designs for a player named Joy Gannon this uh, these color-trimmed dresses. And when we say color-trimmed, like this is Wimbledon, the dress is mainly white, and around the hem, there might be a color. In 1948, this really blew up. So Hazel Whiteman, who we could do another episode on, she's known as the Queen Mother of American Tennis, The Whiteman Cup, of course, is named after her. She took a huge exception to these color trim dresses, and she asked the Wimbledon committee directly to ban them. And then, reportedly, according to Ted, she came up to him and said, quote, No hard feelings, of course, but we do play tennis in white, don't we? (laughs) And in the 1930s, Hazel Whiteman lost it, had a meltdown over Helen Jacobs' shorts. At the time, according to Ted, Wimbledon didn't have an explicit policy of wearing all white. It was just understood that that's the way it was. It wasn't until another 15 or so years later with Maria Bueno that in response to one of Ted Tingling's dresses, Wimbledon enacts a strict all white policy. Which is still uh, in force today, for the most part. So you'll see throughout this episode that this is the first in a long line of incidents between Ted Tindling and Wimbledon, which seemed by design to prod and poke them and to basically annoy them. Ted wrote, quote, The resulting indignation stemmed each time from Wimbledon's all-male philosophy at its worst. At the core of it, one of Ted's if not his greatest aim with his designs, was to bring a much more feminine aesthetic and look to tennis wear. Yes, the the 30s and 40s, and even the 1920s, were characterized by this sort of masculine look in women's tennis. In fashion, of course, in the 20s, women wore very straight designs that didn't emphasize curves, And in tennis in the 30s and 40s, especially during wartime and right after, women wore what's been called uh, sort of masculine-looking clothes. Just very utilitarian, using cheap fabrics because of rationing. It was just work-like. And it mimicked what women were wearing and doing in real life during the war. He said that he was, quote, preconditioned to femininity by the glamour cult of Longlin. (laughs) And the way that he writes about Suzanne, and he's one of really the great chroniclers of who she was, is that her style and her way of moving inspired such hysteria. Like, it it really was a cult of personality around Suzanne, and a, a very early example of celebrity culture. In the late 1940s, 
Christian Dior is debuting what's called the New Look, which is this intentional return to classic femininity, to sexuality, and is a confrontation of those kind of boyish looks of the 20s and 30s. He even harkens back to some 19th century looks that emphasized a tiny waist, this big fluffy skirt that emphasized the hips and the bust, And it was actually seen as wasteful because it used so much fabric and Europe was still in rationing several years after the war. Sure, Ted wanted to bring a more feminine, sexy aesthetic back to tennis. Or for the first time, to tennis. (laughs) And that was something that was always the main sticking point for the establishment, right? That, that, That was the most offensive part of it. But nowhere in that did they take into account the functionality of his designs. The fact that women playing sport at that time, playing tennis, were physically restricted in their movement. That didn't seem to be a concern whatsoever from any of the reading that we did. Mm. It's a it's such an interesting contradiction that you'll see across his life and, and his career is that we talk about him as rebellious, but a lot of Tinling's philosophy is fairly reactionary, right? It's about a return to femininity and emphasis of this feminine form, the way women are supposed to look. And Dior, in the same way, was sometimes seen as regressive because his clothes are very restrictive. Now, Tinling's clothes were different. Despite being very influenced by Dior, like you said, there was an emphasis on beauty and function. And a lot of the players that he designed for remarked that Ted's the only one who knows how to design for my body because he understands what it's like to be a tennis player. He knows how to move. The history of Wimbledon and fashion is marked by two main moments, right? There's 1949 with Gertrude Moran, otherwise known as Gussie Moran, otherwise known as Gorgeous Gussie. (laughs) And then there was the Anne White bodysuit in the mid-1980s. Both outfits designed by Ted Tinling. We're talking about 37 years apart, a 37-year difference, and this man had his hand in both hullabaloos. In 1949, Gussie Moran reached out to Ted directly, wrote to him, and asked him to design for her. Now... Gussie at the time was seen as a sexy in the Lana Turner mode. Like that was the fashion at the time, right? She was curvaceous. She was like a pinup girl, but she was talented. She was chosen by Bill Tilden to get coaching. She had powerful strokes. She had a lot of potential as a player. So as I said, she had written to Ted Tinling and in this letter to Tinling, she asked for color and specifically she asked for blood red referencing quote her red indian blood and uh, that is a quote i'm not saying that that is a uh, how we speak these days ted took up the challenge but he did fear a kind of last minute restriction by the wimbledon committee he designed this dress with white satin trim made of rayon she was super excited about the dress but she said i need something to wear underneath because i normally wear shorts He responded that underclothes are not his responsibility. Nevertheless, she persisted. And this is where the, quote, lace panties were born. Yes, we're going to be saying the word panties more than probably ever in our lives. As far as panties go, they were pretty modest. Ted, last minute, sewed up this garment with coarse cotton lace. I mean... You can search the internet, Google it, and you can find pictures of this. You can see a recreation of this undergarment. But the way it's talked about in this era, you would think she were wearing a thong. Right. Like in today's parlance, these are granny panties. (laughs) Yes. Honestly. And it just so happened that it was trimmed around the edges with some lace. Right. Like, how bored were these people? How repressed were these British people that this was such a shocking sight, mm-hmm. even in 1949? Well, and you'll see it again and again. These And the thing is, like, her skirt was pretty long. 
The skirt was shorter than most, but you only saw glimpses of these lace panties every once in a while. When she was lunging for a shot or bending over, the skirt typically covered them. And this is the picture that you see. Gossimaran in motion, stretched out wide, and that's the only way the photographers are able to get a glimpse of what's going on underneath this dress. Uh, yes. it's, it's absolutely perverse. Uh, photographers literally lay prone on the ground trying to get upskirt photos at Wimbledon. Frank DeFord said, quote, It's difficult to imagine, 35 years later, what an absolute fuss the entire civilized world made over gorgeous Gussie's modest underwear. For his imaginative angle work on the front lines at Court 1, an AP man, Associated Press, won Photographer of the Year honors for a photo of <laughs> Gussie Moran's white lace mm. panties. I'm sure the composition was first rate, but wow. And I think, you know, we talk about Wimbledon all the time in the contemporary sense, but I think we have to acknowledge that this is a private club that was founded in the 1800s that has had a royal patronage since 1907, that has had a member of the royal family serve as its president from 1930 to this day. It's staffed it at the time was staffed by aristocrats, by senior officers and military. This is the metropole of the world's largest empire at the time of its largest reach during the Victorian era. Right, but they also think that they're better than everybody else. Well, of else. course, uh, but this is explaining why. And one example of that that had me laughing and cringing was the whole business of the change from pre-open era tennis to open era tennis. You had the championships, which were Wimbledon. You had the Australian championships, the French championships, and the United States championships. That's what they were called before the open era. 1968 happens, everybody changes their name. But oh no, <laughs> not the championships, not Wimbledon. They are yeah. above it all. They have always been above it all. And that is what they cling to, the pearls that they cling to, to this day. They are still known as the championships. Uh, technically, they are the British Open of tennis. They're the British championships. But as whether you like it or not, reading through history, Wimbledon was seen as the premier tournament in tennis. It was the one that everybody wanted to win. It gave you prestige. And that's just a fact. Right, but my point here is to explain how time and time again over the years, Wimbledon has bucked change, has resisted change mm -hmm. in an attempt to, quote, preserve its history. But it really is just self-serving to maintain its supposed top dog spot. Yes, there's a practical aspect to it. And it's also from way back it allowed this sort of leisure class to to perform their class status during the amateur days these were the gentlemen who didn't have to work they didn't have to win because there was no money involved they did it for the love of the game you know and that was the philosophy of amateurism but it was reserved for a very specific type of person now getting back to these gussie moran panties what happened afterward, I mean, it just set off quite the fracas, as you can imagine. At a middle Sunday lunch held at Queen's Club during the tournament, a Wimbledon committee member got up and attacked Ted Tinling in front of everyone for his tasteless designs, accusing him of putting, quote, sin and vulgarity into tennis. But, as you can imagine, reports of these panties drew large crowds a huge media interest, as you mentioned, with the photographers. Even the Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, told Ted, quote, you've done a great job for tennis this year. At the Wimbledon closing cocktail party, Chairman Lewis Gregg admonished Ted publicly, saying, quote, never shall we allow our center court to become a stage for designers' stunts. And at that moment, Ted decided, as he tells it, that... It was mutually agreed upon that there should be a break between him and Wimbledon. Because at that point, he had been 
working there for some 22 years. Right. And I don't think we'll ever exactly know what happened. Historically, it's frequently told that Ted was banned from Wimbledon. And I think we've probably said it before. According to Ted, it was the result of a lot of soul searching on his part. And it was a a mutual agreement for him to depart. And he thinks that the Wimbledon committee was enacting a sort of cold war against him for several years. It started before the war. He was offered an apprenticeship to become the future secretary of Wimbledon. And the secretary of Wimbledon is essentially the executive director. It's a very high position. But he declined in favor of his fashion career. He also received a gift of very loud and wide neckties from Jack Crawford. And apparently wearing them was a huge mistake. And then, of course, Hazel Whiteman's fuss over the color trim dresses in 1948. If you are to believe the stories and reports that Ted was banned by Wimbledon in 1949, Gussie's panties story was the final straw that broke the camel's back. After Hazel Whiteman's complaints, after the loud neckties, after his initial problems the year before in 1948 with his first designs, they had had enough. If you are to believe that telling of the story. Right. If you were curious about where these lace panties ended up. According to Frank DeFord, Ted Tinling told him that while cleaning out her mother's house after she died, some 30 years after she wore them, Gussie found the panties and threw them out without giving it a second thought. (laughs) From the late 1940s right through till the early 1980s, Ted Tinling is the main tennis designer in women's tennis. So much so that from 1959 to 1979, 12 of those 20 Wimbledon women's champions lifted the Venus Rosewater dish in a Ted Tinling creation. Another of the iconic looks that I want to mention here is his 1962 dress for his friend, Maria Bueno, the Brazilian star. He designed, of course, a white dress. Again, (laughs) this is Wimbledon. But it had a shocking pink lining on the inside. Shocking. Shocking. Was the color shocking pink or was it shocking that it was pink? Both, I would say. And pink panties. And as you mentioned earlier, in 1962, Wimbledon officially banned color again. There was a temporary ban as a result of the Gussie Moran incident that was instituted in 1950. This was another official ban because of Maria Bueno's look. I loved this quote that I just need to drop in here from Ted. He spoke to SI and he said, They actually built up in their own minds that I had put the All England Club colors purple and green, across Bueno's backside as a deliberate insult to them. That would be great had it been deliberate, but it wasn't. And this was in reference to her, quote, rainbow dress from 1965. Everybody who spoke about wearing Ted's clothes, all of the tennis players spoke about how he designed for their specific personalities. He didn't just willy-nilly come up with a design and say, hey, go wear this. He took into account what type of player they were, what type of personality they had off the court. And of Maria Bueno, he said, quote, she had this fantastic brooding character, the impression of an imminent storm. Color had to be used somewhere. This is a thread that is fascinating to me uh, doing reading about Ted and building this episode is so many women tennis players said Ted designed for me. He knew me. And he had friendships with so many of them, right? He was great friends with Maria Bueno, the legend Elizabeth Ryan, Virginia Wade. And he said he could never design for someone unless he saw them play. And this is one of the departures with the current state of tennis fashion for women now. You Mm -hmm. have this mass-produced, ready-to-wear, off-the-rack clothing lines. And we say it and see it all the time when these slams roll around. What is she wearing? Why is she wearing that? And it's because somebody in some office has decided that this is what we're going to give these women to wear now. Somebody at the 
the the top level, one of the players at the top of the rankings who may be the star for Adidas or the star for Nike may have some input in how they wear their dress. And that may trickle down to how the other designs from that line end up looking. But the majority of women don't really have that much say in the clothes that they wear on a tennis court anymore. And so that feeling of an outfit, a a tennis dress being designed specifically for me so that I can feel comfortable, so that I can feel happy wearing it on court, Mm, that's been one of the biggest changes in women's tennis fashion over the last 30, 40 years. And the departure of Ted Tinling from this arena is one of the breaking points for that taking off. Right. And Tinling saw this happen in his own lifetime. He did not actually make money directly from producing these garments for the top female tennis players. These days, of course, companies pay players a ton of money to wear their garments. And they did in the 70s as well. That was starting. But Ted did these things for free and didn't really build up a massive fortune by promoting his alignment with women's tennis. The last Wimbledon champion to wear a Ten Tinling creation on Championship Sunday was Martina Navratilova in 1979. The following year, she signed one of those contracts. Yes, yes. And I just want to go through, you mentioned all of the Wimbledon champions he designed for. Let's just name them. Maria Bueno, Angela Mortimer, Ann Jones, Yvonne Goulagong, Billie Jean King three times, Virginia Wade, and Martina Navratilova. In a Sports Illustrated story in 1969, Ted estimated that two-thirds of the Wimbledon ladies' draw was wearing his clothes. And we're talking about individual designs. You may recall when Ash Barty won Wimbledon last year, she wore a dress that was inspired by the dress that Yvonne Goulagong wore in 1971 when she won Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. And that dress was designed by Ted Tinley. Yes, and I just want to shout out Ted's seamstress, Margaret Goatson Kiergan, who worked for him for decades, who he said hand-cut every dress for him from 1937 into the 70s. Uh, because, you know, this is a woman who is unsung in the story of Ted Tinling, and she actually did a lot of the, the hard work behind the scenes. When tennis goes open in 1968, women's tennis is struggling to get even the smallest piece of the pie. And so it comes as no surprise that somebody who's earned the trust of all these tennis stars over the years by creating things for them, by investing in them, by caring about their comfort and style, that Ted Tinling becomes somebody who is conscripted to do the same again going forward, building the Virginia Slims tour. Given his uh, propensity to kind of buck the the tennis powers that be, he was very proud and took very seriously his role in this women's tennis revolution. You may recall that he was portrayed in the film Battle of the Sexes. He was portrayed by Alan Cumming. It wasn't a great likeness, and it was a very small part, but I felt it was so important to get Ted's name in there because of what he did. I mean, they didn't even try to get a likeness in this role. No. (laughs) You could not have been more off the only similarity is that they were both British. Yes, Ted was six foot seven and bald. But in these early days, uh, Ted writes with immense respect and admiration for Gladys Heldman, who really led the charge alongside Billie Jean King to found the Virginia Slims tour, to hook up with the CEO of Philip Morris to get this huge investment in the first few years of the tour. And in those days, as you probably know, the players themselves were responsible for promoting the game. They were going city to city. It was like this road show. And they were trying to drum up support and even sell tickets in parking lots. And Tinling, you know, came from a much tonier, fancier place and era, felt that he had a responsibility to make women's tennis a spectacle to prove 
like the players were doing, that women's tennis was just as entertaining and just as valuable as men's tennis. And this was an opportunity afforded him in his early 60s. This is somebody who had made his mark in tennis for decades up to this point. And when most folks are slowing down, he is now revving up again. Yeah, this is something that finally hit me a few days ago, was that so many of the visionaries, you know, the cultural visionaries, Paul McCartney, like everybody, Aretha Franklin, like they made their greatest, most revolutionary contributions in their 20s and sometimes 30s. Stevie Wonder. Right. And Ted Tinling is nearing the age of retirement and is still making history. What the Virginia Slims tour offered him was an opportunity to finally incorporate color whenever and however he wanted. You mentioned previously that he said that he would never dare dress a player without seeing her play. He also said that confidence is probably what makes the difference between a victory and a defeat. If a woman feels that she's prettier or better dressed than her opponent, nothing can stop her. I mean, and this I, is a bit... It, these are the contradictions <laughs> that you find when you learn about somebody who was born in 1910 <laughs> and came from a very conservative class and era is that there are, there are a lot of contradictions in the way he talks about women, which today, and even then, by some of the women he designed for, was probably seen as pretty regressive, and in some cases reactionary. But at the same time, he clearly had an immense respect for what these women were doing. Of that 1971 dress that Ivan Gulligan won Wimbledon in, he said, quote, At times, I felt I was grappling with a ghost, trying to grasp the essence of her elusive personality so as to interpret this in her dresses. The real answer is that Yvonne's beauty lies in the exquisite grace of her movements. When she is still, it seems impossible to capture her true identity. Like, this is the mind of an artist. And this is a dream for, some, for a woman to work with in creating <laughs> right. outfits for her to play tennis. Where... Where it becomes a little bit frustrating, looking back at it now, that previous quote about, you know, confidence is when a woman feels that she's prettier or best, better dressed than her opponent. Maybe confidence is knowing that I can feel comfortable in this actual physical garment on court, regardless of what I look like. The fact that it looks cute is a bonus as well you know <laughs> i think we have developed different ways to talk about this same phenomenon whereas you see the body itself as a place of empowerment rather than i'm prettier than this person players have have realized this is the body that i live in that i've learned to love and i've found a garment to to make me proud of it you know like i i think that quote, has taken on a different cast in modern tennis. In 1973, Ted Tinling designed the dress that each of the four slam winners wore. And so when Billie Jean King takes it upon herself to play Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sexes, after Margaret Court famously lost mm -hmm. in the Mother's Day Massacre, Ted looks at it as his opportunity for a tindling slam <laughs> <laughs> you know like a golden slam with the olympics mm -hmm. he will have won all four slams plus the battle of the sexes if he can get billy jean king wearing something that gives her the confidence to beat bobby riggs yes uh, riggs challenged billy jean king and she was famously very reluctant she was mad that margaret court even accepted the challenge but she knew eventually that it was important that she play this match it, you know at least for her that it was important and if she lost that it had the potential to be a catastrophe for the women's tennis experiment i don't know why i didn't know this but it was news to me that the dress that billie jean king wore in that match was not the originally intended dress for her to wear it was actually the backup yeah Apparently, did you know that? I did not know, but 
Ted had designed a very flashy, almost cellophane-like material. And Billie Jean tried it and loved it and loved the way she looked. But she touched it and she said, like, I don't like the way this feels on my hand. It's scratchy. And I cannot handle any distractions in this match. Luckily, he had made a backup, the standby dress. And legend says that the scrutiny around this match was so intense that he refused to submit his bags to customs at JFK. Again, a different time. This dress was a recreation of the dress that Billy won Wimbledon in that year, but an update in that it had color. In print, it looks like it's a regular old white dress, but it's actually, according to Billy and Ted, mint green. And then the collar, if you recall the dress, it's sleeveless. It has this big collar, and then it's buttons all the way down the front of the dress. The collar has this big pop of color, and what we think is a white dress is actually mint green. Yes, and it's decked with this beautiful royal blue kind of brocade pattern. Now, the original dress was very flashy, and it would catch the lights... This match was played in the Houston Astrodome. The cellophane one that Billy decided not to wear. Yes. There were tens of thousands of people in attendance, and it was going to be on TV, of course. This was a TV spectacle more than anything. And so Ted spent the night before sewing on hundreds of rhinestones and sequins so the dress would pop. I loved uh, reading how he spoke about players, especially the ones that he admired. And coincidentally, he admired the ones who wore his designs. (laughs) There's a bit Funny of, how that works. Right. On Billie Jean King, he said, She was not always popular, not always right. She has nonetheless achieved as much and in many ways considerably more for women's equality with men than anyone else in the past 40 years. You might ask if he designed for the next generation of female stars, Evert Navratilova. And he had never designed for Chris Evert until he was asked to design for the 1978 Fed Cup team. And shortly after that, Chris Everett asked him to design her wedding dress for her marriage to John Lloyd. And at that point, it was the 14th wedding dress that he had designed for a tennis player's wedding. I mean, he was in his bag with wedding dresses as well, because (laughs) that's what he initially started doing. Yes. It wasn't until after World War II that he started designing tennis dresses. He designed for Martina from 1974 to 1979, and... You know, her her career as a Grand Slam winner didn't really pop off until the mid to late 70s. So she won in Tinling Designs in 78 and 79 in Wimbledon. And she left for a big contract in 79. And this is where the wind was blowing, right? Ted competed with Fred Perry throughout his life. Fred Perry was a close friend of his and then a fairly fierce rival as a designer. But clothes were going in the direction of Lacoste. Takini, and then eventually Fila, Puma, Nike, Adidas. Alas. And you can't, you know, Ted Tinling was not able to compete with that because he was a small outfit. There was no mass production and he wasn't interested in competing with that. At the end of the 70s is where his career really starts to wind down as a couturier. And it coincides with his reintroduction into tennis in an administrative fashion. Interesting, you know, as you get older and maybe a a little defanged, those old institutions start to warm up to you again. Maybe they have different leadership. Maybe your own resentments have faded a little bit. And his friendship with Philippe Chatrier, who was the president of the ITF, paved the way for his re-entry into tennis leadership. We are also coming off the back of the rise of women's lib in America. The reasons why Ted would have been supposedly banned in 1949, those reasons are now squarely archaic for the time as well. Right, right. In 1979, Chatrier appointed him to his own personal staff. And then a few years later, the big breakthrough happened. The Wimbledon committee invited Ted back after several decades as the player liaison, which was essentially the role that he left in 1949. The leadership knew that one of Tinling's major strengths was mediation. (laughs) His ability to hobnob and pacify the famous and the wealthy. 
and allegedly 1982, one of the players who needed most pacification was John McEnroe. <laughs> yes. Ted actually believes that's part of the reason he was asked back and, and to lead this liaison committee with the players because McEnroe was such a handful and because it was evident that McEnroe wasn't going anywhere. In this new next phase of his career, Ted wears a whole bunch of familiar, some even new hats in administrative roles. He's again back as player liaison at Wimbledon. He is the international liaison and director of the Virginia Slims Tour. He's also the chef de protocol or chief of protocol of the ITF from 1978 to 1990. One of the things that never really went away, even as he moved into this kind of ceremonial phase of his life, he he was in a few of those roles until his death in 1990. He was always picking, especially at Wimbledon, right? In the late 70s and the early 80s, he was writing for the New York Times as a columnist off and on, and he was always poking at the stodginess of Wimbledon, he said that Wimbledon has deliberately put itself outside the pale. History does not treat Wimbledon kindly on its attitude toward fashion. It made me think that throughout his life and throughout the 20th century in tennis, you can see tennis is an extremely conservative and restrictive environment, but there are these infinite points of rebellion, right, where people fought against it. And it's not all revolution. It's not all meant to take down the system. But there's always resistance everywhere. And sorry if this gets, like, too Foucaultian. Please, not that. <laughs> right. not, not Mr. Foucault. But I find tennis so fascinating because we see a million rebellions in such a, a restrictive environment. Like, you can see what people do when given this cage. Like I said before, Wimbledon was and is a private club. It was staffed by, I mean, really, like the leaders of colonization. These are English gentlemen. These are people who do not work for a living, who embody this mythical Englishness. And a lot of that still remains. A lot of that tradition is still there. The royal patronage, the, the presidency of Wimbledon. And embedded in that is like this code of amateurism, which, of course, tennis is now professional. But for many, many years, amateurism meant that a certain class of people could perform their class status. This was the playground for them. But my point in saying that is within that, you see so many people chafe at those boundaries. Suzanne Longland's clothing, her drinking on court during matches, her attitude, her demands that she be paid for the work and the value that she's creating. Fred Perry, who now we see, you know, is the last English man to win Wimbledon, was working class. He was very uncomfortable. Before Andy Murray. Well, I said English. Oh, okay. Yeah. But there's so much that we don't talk about. Like, he was extremely uncomfortable with bending to the royals at Wimbledon. He was seen as brazen and sort of low class because he wanted to win so badly. And then, of course, Ted Tenling's designs. Uh, another site of resistance. You just described a lot of micro revolutions, <laughs> you know, micro picking. Sure. That, you know, over time can pick away at the master's house, but it doesn't really do anything to destroy it. Like Wimbledon Correct. is still here. Correct. But what they can and have shown is how unwilling. Not just unprepared, but unwilling the master, Wimbledon, is willing to adapt to the changing times, to give up some of that stodginess to make way for change, to make way for freedoms for players. What do they do when somebody like Venus and Serena Williams show up on center court at Wimbledon? wearing a head full of beads there's an equal and opposite reaction right anytime something like this happens they still have underwear inspectors to this day they have people looking at the soles of players shoes to de determine whether the color is allowed 
so many of those restrictions are there, but there is there are changes, right? Like there is corporate sponsorship at Wimbledon, which they banned for a century. I mean, it's 2022, and now the winners will not be referred to by their husband's married name. <laughs> right. I think what we've seen by researching Ted's life and the history of tennis is that there's there's only so much rebellion allowed and and still being allowed to exist within the system, right? Ted was somebody with a lot of respect for tradition, grace, as he called it. He has respect for respect. This was not somebody who was a necessarily socially liberal revolutionary figure. This was somebody who had great reverence for Margaret Thatcher. Right. Well, I mean, he he spoke of her favorably in an interview. I don't know how, uh, you know, complete his political views were. That was alarming to see that he was happy that Thatcher was sort of reviving a certain type of Englishness. He said a few things about feminism that kind of made me cock an eyebrow. <laughs> you know, he said America's influence has produced a mentality of misguided equality. The idea if you serve in volley like men, you can be equal to men. I've never thought anybody should copy anybody else. Instead, you should promote what is different. And so in there, like you see you know, the movement kind of divorced from power. Of course, you should celebrate difference. But what he he was along the ride for was a direct confrontation of the idea that women are not as good. And Billie Jean in the original nine argued, well, we may not be able to beat all the men, but we're just as good. The product is just as entertaining and we deserve to be paid. 1986, Ted Tinling is celebrated for his then- 65, almost 65 years in tennis with an induction into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. During his induction, he says, quote, I'm very incredulous and bemused about being enshrined in this ultimate shrine of tennis, the International Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum. As somebody said to me before I came in, how nice to be in a museum before you're stuffed. <laughs> And Ted continued his work in the ITF and the WTA throughout the late 80s, and he passed away in May of 1990 after suffering for a few months with respiratory problems. And you remember that he had respiratory problems as a child as well. It was very shortly before his 80th birthday, and before his death, he predicted that Martina Navratilova was going to win Wimbledon that year, despite her decline, despite the rise of Steffi and Monica, and he was right. So this Pride Month, we decided to bring a spotlight to the life and career and contributions of one of the many queer people who've made indelible contributions to the sport that we love. And we hope that you've enjoyed this retrospective on Ted Tinling. Before we go, we want to talk about a couple things that came up while we were reading (laughs) that we couldn't necessarily find a seamless way to weave into the the narrative telling of this episode so we're just gonna throw in a little bit of an etc section here to talk about this stuff because (laughs) yeah first we'll get to mr bill tilden but elizabeth ryan this has to be one of the most fascinating people in all of tennis history this is somebody who lived all the way till the age of, I think, 87. She was Suzanne Longland's longtime doubles partner. They won a whole host of slam titles together in doubles. They were unbeaten for years at one point. Such a formidable duo they were, and they were great friends. Now, at the end of Elizabeth Ryan's life, she finds herself at Wimbledon, and at this particular Wimbledon, Billie Jean King is on the cusp of beating her all-time record of most of most Wimbledon titles won. At that time it would have been 19. Of course this includes singles, doubles, mixed doubles. And to say that Elizabeth Ryan was not fond of this occurrence is an understatement. (laughs) You need only go to Elizabeth Ryan's Wikipedia page to get a perfect summation of what went down. 
1979, Elizabeth Ryan was present for Wimbledon for the possibility of Billie Jean King to pass her record of 19 Wimbledon titles. Elizabeth was 87 years old, and Bud Collins tried to arrange an interview for TV between Ryan and King, and Elizabeth Ryan said, no thanks. (laughs) Billie said that, quote, I always liked seeing Miss Ryan at Wimbledon, and I tried to be friendly, but she didn't seem to want it. For me, it wasn't personal. Sure, I wanted the record, but I wasn't trying to steal a possession of hers. There is no doubt in my mind that she just didn't want to be alive to see her record broken. And reader, she died. In the most dramatic way, Miss Ryan really was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. She watched the men's doubles final, collapsed, and passed away the day before the women's doubles final where Billie Jean King surpassed her 19 titles. According to Ted Tinling, he says that two years before her death, Elizabeth Ryan told him, quote, I hope I don't live to see my record broken, but if someone is to break it, I hope it is Billie Jean. She has so much courage on the court. She had seen enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. And Ted wrote so much about Ryan's playing style and how she basically introduced the Servant Valley game to Americans tennis and perfected it. And so Billie Jean King is in in a long line of great American Servant Valleyers like Ryan. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth Ryan is also a character that will feature quite prominently in Tom Humberstone's upcoming graphic publication about Suzanne Longlen. Yes, stay tuned out this fall. Who knows, there may be some kind of collaborating happening there in the next little bit between us and Tom. More so than just the wonderful (laughs) graphics that he designs for us. Yeah, there's been a lot of collaboration so far. (laughs) I mean, you don't have to be cute about it. We'll probably have Tom on the show and talk to him. (laughs) Finally, after all these years of working with Tom. You mentioned earlier kind of the elephant in the room, Bill Tilden. Right. One of the really the great American sporting stars of that golden age. This was the age of Babe Ruth, Jim Thorpe, the 20s and 30s. And Tilden, in many ways, unless you're in tennis, is the forgotten star of that age. And there's a pretty specific reason for it, because when he retired from tennis, he got into some legal trouble for soliciting underage boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be clear, he also seemed like he was an asshole. Yes, there's that that too. Right. Tilden was a superstar. He despised Suzanne Longlin for some reason, like hated her, wanted her to fail. He was close friends with the American Mala Mallory, who was one of Suzanne's rivals and who Suzanne typically beat. And so that's where he comes into Ted Tinling's story. But Ted does talk about how Bill Tilden's homosexuality was a very open secret at the time. He also described himself, Ted, as being a little bit more open-minded than most about predilections, predilections, stuff that he got himself into, and then segues into talking about how it was widely known that Ted had a 13-year-old boy shacked up with him who would just be sitting on his lap. Yeah, so Tilden had this habit of basically picking teenage boys as doubles partners, I think the term we're looking for is grooming. Yes, yes. This particular one in the French Riviera apparently was the son of a teaching pro, and he would stay in Tilden Suite. But at the same time, other historians explained that Tilden had a deep aversion to physical touch, and that uh, in Frank DeFord's biography of him, he said that Tilden did not actually have relations with men until he was much older. So, of course, nobody knows. We don't know what really happened, but obviously it makes the legacy of Bill Tilden really difficult to talk about. Yeah, it would be nice to sit here and say, well, oh, wow, we have this great gay icon at the onset of global tennis to now celebrate here in Pride Month 2022, to look back on with fondness, with sadness for all the things that he went through but that's just very complicated by the not knowing the extent of what happened Mm -hmm. but tinling points out that 
Tilden's class status shielded him from a lot of homophobia, especially being in France at the time. He said that French culture sort of looked upon that as don't ask, don't tell. I mean, we're, we're even talking about the possibility of being with underage kids, right? Mm. That he was shielded from criticism and from the law because of his sort of, not only his celebrity status, but his patrician Philadelphia kind of, he was part of the Philadelphia gentry, essentially. He grew up in Philadelphia cricket clubs. Like, this is the absolute elite of East Coast America. These were also two gentlemen who grew up at a time where Hollywood was very much intertwined with tennis. Yes. And so there is a a certain safety net, as tenuous as it is and was, that's built in with that relationship, Mm -hmm. whereby you can still move in certain circles, but there are also gay men in Hollywood who are in the same position, who have benefited from the kindness and protection of women Mm. in Hollywood and in tennis. Yeah, and I think if you look at these two men in parallel, you see different queer stories, right? You you see a very familiar story at the time of a successful gay man dying in destitution, in poverty, and in notoriety, essentially. And then you see someone like Ted Tinling about whose personal life we know very, very little but who was basically allowed to live as a lovable dandy, as a someone who everyone knew was gay, but it seemed wasn't really talked about very openly, but was allowed to, to flourish and live a very full life. He also lived longer to be able to experience that in the public. Yes. Before we go, I just want to recognize some of the sources that we use that were very helpful for this episode. Obviously, Ted Tinling's books, the primary sources here, Frank DeFord, the sociologist Christy Treadway, whose article about Ted was extremely helpful. Former tennis player, former professional tennis player who was coached by Rosie Casals. Really? Yes. One of the things, if you decide to go back and do your own kind of looking into this stuff, one of the things you should absolutely do is find pictures of Ted's dresses. There's a lot of information on that. There are a lot of galleries online. So many of these tennis players donated their tinling creations to museums. And so they're available for us to now to go back and look at. And while some of them are are curious, (laughs) a lot of them are stunning. Yeah. The Australian Tennis Museum, uh, we'll link to this, they put together this gorgeous infographic with Google Arts and Culture, and I recommend viewing it on a desktop because you can kind of scroll through the photos. The graphic design is just really nice. Thanks for sticking with us through this episode. We hope you learned something from it like we did. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. You can find everything BodyServe related at linktree.com slash thebodyserve. Thanks for listening. Till next time.